is the martyr archetype and the historic martyrs, but the martyr complex of things we see in sitcoms, things we see uh-huh. in our personal yeah. lives. It's become really a colloquial pop psychology term. We're talking about a kind of character. And this is usually somebody who habitually sacrifices their desires and needs for the benefits of others. And in a way that's often, like you said, very visible, they may present themselves as perpetual victims and they're quietly suffering mm-hmm. the injustices or, or not so quietly. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can switch over and and talk a little bit about uh the more colloquial meaning yes. of the term i've Which been is, i've been waiting to get see. there go for it <laughs> uh yeah i i'm i've been thinking about how relational this whole concept of of mm. martyrdom is that it must be witnessed yep it's a performance Uh, it's a perform it's a performance and a statement and a call in its best sense to a higher awareness a higher consciousness uh adherence to as you're saying the religious function Mm -hmm. and a a principle that is more valuable and uh oftentimes in personal life um, being a martyr is a way of disparaging somebody. Of like, oh my God, uh, you know, this person is just such a such a martyr. Um, but that behind it often is a call on that person's part, the would-be martyr's part, to attention. Mm-hmm. Pay attention. Uh, w- witness what what I am doing. Uh, um, Please understand me, uh, and that uh, beyond the the sense of feeling irritated or manipulated that we can sometimes feel uh, uh, is is the wish to be understood. Mm-hmm. But I think when we look at somebody, and uh, you know, I know when I can. You know, I feel a sense of resentment or something is being triangulated or it's chronic or something else. Um, that That's what gives the person who's a martyr uh, sort of a negative uh, feeling tone. Well, we talk about the martyr complex. Mm-hmm. I think that we, which uh, fair enough. Is sure. the martyr archetype and the historic martyrs, but the martyr complex. Uh, things we see in sitcoms, things we see uh-huh. in our personal yeah. lives. It's become really a colloquial pop psychology term, which of course deserves our, our attention. And we're, we're talking about a kind of character. And this is usually somebody who um, you know, uh, habitually sacrifices their desires and needs for the benefits of others. And in a way that's often, like you said, very visible, they may present themselves as perpetual victims and they're quietly suffering mm-hmm. the injustices or, or not neglect. so quietly, <laughs> or not so quietly, you know, the Eeyores of our lives. Um, they often may use their sacrifices to uh, make other people feel guilty mm-hmm. and in, in that way, somehow being manipulative. So yes, they get a kind of emotional advantage. Mm-hmm. And just as both of you had said many times, a need for recognition, a deep-seated mm-hmm. need to be acknowledged and appreciated. So, you know, the volunteer who says, oh, of course I'll do that. You know, I, I, I didn't sleep for 30 hours in order to lick all the envelopes and make sure that they all went out. It was nothing at all. You know, I just, you know, I don't know why I just said that, you know. Um, but wanting that, recognition that I, I've suffered greatly uh, to please, to serve, and uh, there is a, there's something gratifying about doing that and having it, it known. And I think it's the manipulative quality of that when we talk about it in terms of uh, mm-hmm. popular psychology that really gets under our skin. Mm-hmm. That somebody's doing mm-hmm. something to us as they begin to to shape themselves as being martyrs and particularly mm-hmm. being martyrs for us. Yeah. I'm yeah. your martyr. 
whether or not you like it. Mm -hmm. So Joseph, I'm going to go back to the word that you helpfully used really early on. You talked about how there's a certain kind of inflation and you even Mm -hmm. said that for you, there was something protective about that in childhood. And, Mm -hmm. um, but but I but I think you know the kind of collo- the colloquial sense of the term martyr, there there is a kind of negative inflation. Like I've yeah. suffered more than anyone else. This is harder for me, and and there's a certain kind of glorying in that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's related to the idea of the help refusing complainer, mm-hmm. because you know it's someone says, "Well, I'm just so tired," and you know, but I'll do it, and then some. Well, well I'll take that on. No, 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 it's okay. I'll do it, you know. So, and it, it is, it is, uh, there's a, there's a certain enjo- reveling in, you know, how, how awful your situation is and making sure everyone else knows about it in some way. So, there's also this wonderful expression, the tyranny of the weak. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that this kind of, mm-hmm. this kind of martyrdom that we're talking about really has to do with, Claiming power indirectly, it's a, it's, an, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a sort of subtle, backhanded way of trying to get power. I mean, the, the CEO of the company is rarely acting like a martyr, mm-hmm. you know. There's a, there's a way that that person can hold authority mm-hmm. and ask for what she wants and be very direct. The, but the martyr, it's like an unconscious uh, or semi-conscious uh, kind of sideways power play. And actually, uh, isn't that present um, in the other dimensions of, of martyrdom that we have discussed, of, of the Thomas More mm-hmm. could say, I refuse to sign and I am willing to die. And that is claiming a certain kind of power. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the the help rejecting complainer who says, "No, no, no. I'll you know I'll just I'll just suffer um, vocally over here." Mm-hmm. Uh, where we can sense the resentment and the and the anger. Yep. You know, inherent in that situation. Uh, and we have a very different reaction to it uh, than, than we might have had had we been around when Thomas More was making his decision. Uh, that we sense that there's something manipulative, something covert, uh, and we push back. Uh, you know, we say, "Okay, fine then." You, you know, you you stay here after hours and. And finish licking all those envelopes. You know what I'm thinking of is that I'm, I'm thinking that um, but maybe both kind of martyrs are trying to evoke a certain response in the other person. Mm. Um, at least some of the time. I mean, certainly the, the monk who self-immolated was, was trying to change foreign policy in the rest of the world toward Vietnam. But I, but I think the, uh, the, the sort of passive-aggressive martyr is is trying to uh, get a response to, I mean, I think like, like, I think it was you, Joseph, who talked about guilt, trying mm-hmm. to evoke guilt, not actually often trying to evoke real help, <laughs> right? Because then you might say, hey, do you have some time today to help me lick envelopes? You might just be direct about it. But you, you want some credit, you want attention, um, and, and that's where the negative inflation comes in. And sometimes I think people do this because They've never had a straight shot to being admired or acknowledged somehow, because maybe because of a cultural reason that hasn't been super open to them. So then they have to do it in this kind of covert way, you know. Uh, so sometimes I think maybe, for example, women in a, in a more traditional culture uh, might, you know, especially women who were sort of born with like a lot of leadership capacity or something that's just thwarted because of life circumstances, that person might become a real martyr because there's some part of her that's trying to come into fullness and expression, but there isn't really a way. So it comes out in a kind of sideways way uh, where, you know, there's this, uh, there's this kind of covert expression of power and, and manipulation and trying to get something from the other person. So 
No, I think the idea of guilt, and particularly unconscious guilt, and how that plays into the martyr complex, because when people are holding a massive amount of unconscious guilt, there's a way in which they're expiating that by putting themselves in situations that produce a tremendous amount of personal suffering to them. And through projective identification, the personal suffering that they're displaying will make the other person feel guilty Mm -hmm. So that it puts some guilt into the other person, which gives the martyr a sense of relief. And this kind of scenario, I think, is much more common than people realize. Hmm. So it's a very sophisticated dance that's trying to relieve tension in multiple ways. I will orchestrate punishing myself in such a way that you will assume some guilt for it. Mm -hmm. And both the punishment and the projective identification create a temporary sense of relief mm-hmm. in the person who's holding an enormous amount of unconscious guilt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, another part of the dynamic maybe is like kind of not really taking full responsibility for yourself, right? So if you want help, looking the envelopes, you don't say, gosh, I want help looking the envelopes. I better make sure I can get that somehow. And instead you, you, um, you kind of offload that responsibility onto those around you who then, and it's a double bind, right? Because they feel guilty, but there's no possible way that they can relieve your suffering because you're not going to let them. It's an interesting configuration because they need the personal suffering of licking 5,000 envelopes Mm -hmm. over 36 (laughs) hours to expiate something and they also want you to feel bad about it so that they feel a relief in themselves it's right it's a very very complicated dance and it's happening unconsciously and we all know it no yeah, yeah. We all we all know these people. We all I mean, I, I can acknowledge that sometimes I have a little bit of that, you know, that impulse to want to be the martyr. I can feel that in myself. And we've probably all done it at one time or another. And we probably know people who inveterately do it. And generally we just want to stay as far away as possible from them. Mm. You know, I think there's a connection with covert narcissism. And victimhood, Uh, you know, and the victim calls up uh, the opposite of of the abuser. You know, at first we may feel guilty, but then we tend to walk out of the room and then say, fine, keep licking the envelopes then. Uh, So now our our would-be martyr uh, is even more of a victim. Uh, and, and perhaps we feel guilty for for leaving them to it, um, but it's not honest emotionally. Yes, yeah, that's a great way of putting it's it. It's not. It's not honest. Mm-hmm. Of you know, of the the person is not able to say, "I want help" or "I want your attention." I want to feel cared for. Um, I don't feel valued. Uh, and so this this dynamic tends to just uh, perpetuate. It often is very chronic. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's, it's a like real... A characterological kind of thing. Exactly. Uh, Here's, I'm, I'm looking for kind of examples that are not, or, or that are not extraordinary. So I'm thinking about um, a particular client I had a number of years ago who was a single parent. And uh, worked very, very long hours, um, felt really stressed, really exhausted. But deep down, he felt very, very guilty because he was not spending enough time with his son. And, and on a, right on the edge of consciousness, felt like he was, he was neglecting the child, although in an outer way, it was perfectly reasonable. He, he didn't earn a lot of money and needed to work as much as he did. Out of that guilt around not providing enough time for his son, mm-hmm. I think he started to um, 
not eat right. He lost an enormous amount of weight. Um, he would sometimes come into sessions um, looking gaunt, dark rings under his eyes. And at first I used to think, well, that, that maybe that's required in some strange mm. way by this abusive work situation he mm -hmm. was in. But I began to see that he was orchestrating this kind of self-punishing behavior. It took a long time for us to, to get to this sense of guilt that he had to add a level of punishment beyond the amount of work he was doing mm. because of feeling guilty uh, about his child. And then where things really started breaking down is his child started feeling incredibly guilty. And so, you know, his 10-year-old son was kind of desperately um, and anxiously trying to make amends as if he had done something wrong, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. constantly apologizing for everything in a way that was strange and odd. Mm -hmm. and, and so the feeling of guilt was actually beginning to rise up in his son mm -hmm. that the father was actually feeling for being neglectful. Well, you're, I think, uh, really lifting up the dynamics here or some of the dynamics and what can create uh, a martyr complex. Exactly. It is that a child can become parentified, uh, that uh, if mom or dad uh, cannot provide the kind of, of connection and attention that the child needs, the child can begin to uh, take the responsibility for the relationship and become pleasing. Of you know, so look, I cleaned I cleaned up the whole kitchen before you came home because I know you work so hard. Um, of look, I I'm doing this and I'm doing that, and that that can become deeply ingrained. That you have to earn love, you have to earn attention, you have to work for it, and that that can then become uh, your fictitious person who who stays up late licking envelopes and. Mm -hmm resents it because that's the part that never gets addressed is that that was a child once who deserved more parental time and attention than he or she got. 